Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Transit Tangents. I'm Lewis. I'm Chris. And today we are interviewing a candidate for mayor here in Austin, Texas to find out all of her positions as it pertains to transit and transit related things. Uh, pretty excited for the conversation. Yeah, see how it goes. Well, Carmen, thank you so much for joining us today. I am very excited about this conversation. Oh, me too. Um, just to get things started, can you sort of tell us where we are and um, what is your connection to this part of Austin? Oh, we are in a beautiful spot on what we now call Lady Bird Lake, what those of us uh, from the 20th century called Town Lake for many years. And we're sitting in a part of uh, what Old East Austin calls Chicano Park, um, is also known as uh, part of the Festival Beach or Fiesta Gardens, right? Uh, numerous names, but this is East Town Lake and the neighborhood is East Town Lake. And in full transparency, I am not from this neighborhood. Okay. I know this neighborhood. I know many of the neighbors from here. I love um, this area and this area has a really important history um, in Austin. I would say in Austin's history and its civic history, political history, racial history, um, and also for the East Side. So we're on the site of a lot of really important um, social activity, political activities, and lots of things that have shaped the city. Um, and of course, uh, all of that has informed my journey here. But again, um, I grew up uh, just on the other side of the highway, Central and East Austin. And so I'm very appreciative to the neighbors here, especially of East, Ta East Town Lake and Holly, um, who have given me a lot of oral history that's shaped my perspective. Um, so obviously we're, uh, we're a transit focused podcast here. Uh, so we want to go through and kind of, you know, as a mayoral candidate, get your stances on some different parts of the transit system here in Austin. Uh, that includes obviously everything from buses, potential trains, the, you know, commuter rail we have, uh, but also includes the highway that is over your shoulder right now, uh, I-35. Yeah. Um, obviously, the construction on the kind of expansion of I-35 is slated to begin later this year. Uh, I'm curious where you stand on I-35 as it is now, the proposed plan from, from TxDOT. Um, yeah, I'm curious where, where, where you stand on that. Yeah, sure. So the I-35 expansion primarily impacts areas of, of the central corridor, and so um, so not in Gava's neighborhoods of focus, mm -hmm. but certainly as an Austinite, I'm heavily concerned. And my neighborhood is actually impacted because I live in a neighborhood called Delwood 2, which mm -hmm. is directly adjacent to I-35, um, just south of Capitol Plaza, um, like basically in the 4500 block, right? Mm -hmm. So where the upper deck of I-35 ends, that's right where my neighborhood is. And we will definitely be, in, we are impacted by I-35. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the only reasons my neighborhood hasn't signed on to the civic complaints and lawsuit against the expansion mm -hmm. um, is because uh, the officers of my neighborhood decided they wanted a seat at the table to continue to talk to TxDOT and, gotcha. and get live okay. updates. Uh, but I personally am very supportive of the lawsuit, very appreciative mm -hmm. to the people, the individuals and organizations that put their name on it. Right. Um, because and you're talking about the, the Rethink 35 yes, uh, thank lawsuit you. and the kind of coalition of folks there. Okay. Yes, specifically looking at what we call NEPA laws, you know, and how EPA protections are supposed to extend at the state level, uh, the impacts that are supposed to be looked at, um, and the disproportionate impacts that certain neighborhoods have experienced uh, in terms of air pollution and, and other, you know, just danger, contamination, noise pollution, all of the things. So uh, I grew up on both sides of 35. Uh, it's been a divider, but it's also been a contributor of you know, negative impacts. And of course I've had to use it like a lot of right. yeah, Austinites, yeah. right? And I also recognize that we have a tremendous congestion issue when it comes to traffic and that comes into transit, right? Um, and we, as a city, may not be able to prevent the expansion of I-35 right. given that this falls under the Texas Department of Transportation. Right, right. But we certainly can push for our rights to mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, and we can certainly look at ways to minimize the negative impacts and leverage local investment so that we get the maximum benefit, it, when, whether that's more right of way for affordability, whether that's the cap and stitch, which is putting you know public space, walkable space or park space over the highway. 
very ambitious, pie in the sky <laughs> a little bit. But we should fight for what we believe. We should visualize what it is that we want. And uh, I'm just grateful to people who are, you know, putting their name out there and putting in the resources to challenge it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, as as mayor, would you consider, I know that this means a lot to, well, we've done an episode with some of the Rethink 35 folks. Uh, would you be kind of signing on to a vision like they have or still kind of up in the air? Yes, absolutely. I already okay. did sign on to okay. the civic yeah, complaint yeah, as yeah. an individual. Okay. That's yes, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank, thank you for clarifying because I think, um, you know, folks were waiting for that. And right. I was sort of, like I said, I was sort of pushing in my neighborhood. Right. But I really respect the the interest, you know, of some of my neighbors to stay at the table. And gotcha. I think it's important. That's why this has to be coalition wide. Absolutely. As an individual, I'm 100% signed on. Awesome. 35 expansion is one big project uh, about to get started in Austin. The other really big project, hopefully about to get started in Austin, both of these obviously have lawsuits going on with them, uh, is Project Connect. Um, uh, Project Connect obviously was passed in 2020. Here we are, 2024. It, to me, at least feels like a painfully, painfully slow process of, of getting these things done. I'm sure it's slow everywhere, but uh, I'm kind of curious. Oh, you've got something. Well, as I say, it's, it's painfully slow, but also uh, what we sort of voted for as a city is very different than the plan that is being proposed today for Project Connect. Um, I think most people understand with COVID and inflation, um, prices have gone up. It's a lot harder to build out Project Connect like we initially envisioned it. Um, we attended the ATP open house uh, this past week and got um, a really good, I think an in-depth view of what the actual plan is starting to look like. Um, so I think we're on board, yeah. uh, but we're definitely curious to hear um, your thoughts on, on Project Connect and, and how it's going to impact the city and if you have any concerns about it as well. <laughs> yeah, I have tons of ideas and thoughts and supportive ideas and also concerns. Um, and I think it's important to distinguish Project Connect, the plan, mm -hmm. you know, the vision of Project Connect. Hello, Grackle. <laughs> <laughs> we are surrounded by Grackles. <laughs> they have an opinion about transit too, apparently. Um, you know, distinguishing the vision of Project Connect and what it's supposed to be, uh, that's very important to distinguish from the actual taxation policies mm -hmm. that, you know, and, and the implementation processes um, that, that have so far taken effect. Right. Um, and so I say that because it's really easy to get up in this, like caught up in this, are you against Project Connect? Are you for Project Connect? Mm -hmm. And I am absolutely for the vision of Project Connect. We deserve good transit in the city. We are right. too big of a city mm -hmm. to not have adequate transit. Um, we have an entire population that depends on transit in this city. And I want to see us make more investments that center the transit dependent because they actually know the system the best right. and can guide practicality. Mm -hmm. I think too often um, it is very alluring to make sort of hypothetical deals and bargains. And unfortunately with the patterns of inequity and segregation in the city, and now we are like one of the most economically segregated cities and that's even worse after COVID, we start making decisions as a city that charge the hardest working people who are fighting the hardest to stay in Austin the most money to provide services to a hypothetical population that we hope will get here and we hope will choose to use these assets. And that includes transit. It also includes housing. Yeah. So what are we subsidizing? And that's why Project Connect was really difficult. Um, for a lot of voters because they were weighing the decision, you know, we, we have to invest in transit. We ha and we, this is, you know, a huge opportunity to have this much funding mm -hmm. put forward toward transit. I think we just always have to look at for whom. The people who are, are complaining, including legally against Project Connect, are pointing out very, very valid inequities. And I can tell you that at the time that the Project Connect taxation, you know, ballot item mm -hmm. was up for, you know, promotion, we had residents in North Austin in mixed income communities who were being told, you know, you have to vote for Project Connect. This is crucial and yet we're taking away your critical bus line because the domain needs more service. And so there were these like 
real time inequities of people's transit services being taken away in the same way that when you see people who are living in affordable housing and their housing is demolished in order to make way for more units in the name of supply, but they can't afford any of them. Right. It's not about housing for them. It's about housing for someone else. Is this transit for the people who rely on transit and the people who would use transit who live here right now? Mm -hmm. I believe we all want that. Right. And it's going to take really careful adjustments and calibrations. Now, you all, having gone to the most recent meeting, probably have more updates. But my understanding is that a lot of the, like, three, two or three of the lines that we anticipated for Project Connect, which even though we knew, you know, some of them were only going to be studied mm -hmm. at first, are now, they seem like they're off the table. Yes. Yeah. At this stage, and I kind of want to drill down on a couple of these points. Yeah. So uh, at this stage, it, it is definitely significantly rolled back for phase one. So now they're kind of like laying this out in a phase approach, just given the budget constraints is the kind of, that's the line that ATP is, is kind of putting out there. Um, uh, they're also operating with like a 40% contingency for cost overruns and whatnot, which seems like a lot, um, uh, which, which they're saying, you know, this extra money might be able to get us further in this phase one, but, um, yeah, it absolutely, we, we were saying that if you give yourself a budget, you're going to use the budget. Yeah. Which is so. a little concerning. So it absolutely like the, the green line, for example, the commuter line that is cap Metro says that still is in the plans, but that is separate from the light rail. Uh, the light rail portion has been scaled back. So right now. It will be running from Riverside area, from Yellow Jacket, uh, which is basically, uh, it's just past Montopolis, run through Riverside, um, and then cut north at uh, Guadalupe area, across near the waterfront over there, and then continue up and end at 38th right now. Yeah. So on the north end, it's definitely leaving out neighborhoods that you're yeah. that you're describing. Um, I do think though, uh, as someone I, I used to live on Riverside near Pleasant Valley, um, and I used to ride the 20 quite often over there. That is a neighborhood that would benefit quite a bit from this. But there are absolutely neighborhoods that you're pointing out that I think would be missing out on at least the initial investment points of this. And, and part of the mission of ATP and Project Connect was to serve historically underserved communities. So um, that's the communities that you're talking about, you know, I am happy to see that it's on Riverside. Yeah. Um, I mean, it will make a, uh, as someone, again, I used to ride that bus fairly often. Those buses are jam packed all the yeah. time. Uh, it's like uh, not exaggerating standing room only a lot of the cases. So it will make an impact for them. But I, I do, I do uh, hear your point though about the, the other one. So I yeah. guess, what do with, we do? With the, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I guess, I guess you're, you're, you're running for mayor as yeah. mayor. What would, would you, push to be continuing forward with the plan that exists? Would you be looking to, yeah, what, what, what would you do as mayor? Well, two things. I think, uh, you know, there's, again, there's only so much the council can do. Right. And right. ultimately the ATP makes a lot of these decisions and there's right. a community equity uh, point of that. There is a plan there to, you know, assess who is getting impacted, who's benefiting, who's paying, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not just the lack of services, it's the fact that these neighborhoods have experienced an increased tax burden, which mm -hmm. also feeds into rents, right. and people have already been displaced. Right. So, and, and they're not getting the transit services, but there is money there, mm -hmm. and there are recommendations that can be implemented right now. You all mentioned bus services. Right. I mean, if we could even get better circulation mm -hmm. to reach some of these services, that would do wonders. Yeah. Um, and we are seeing some some piloted programs. Uh, I want to give uh, Councilmember Fuentes in D2, you know, credit for the circulators, the sort of like outside of Metro access, even mm -hmm. um, a sort of low cost ride share um, for people to get to the lines right. of service that they you know, need. Like pickup service. Is that right? Yep, exactly. And yep. this is why GAVA, I mean, I'm, I'm on <laughs> personal time right now campaigning, but just pulling <laughs> on my work from GAVA, you know, we wrote an if then a statement about Project Connect when it was on the ballot. Mm -hmm. We weren't for or against. We said, if it passes, this is what we want to see. If it doesn't mm -hmm. pass, this is what we want to see. Right. So some of those things include on both sides, mm -hmm. increased circulators and increased bus services that are going to actually serve those communities and make sure there's a benefit. Yeah, the second piece of this is anti-displacement because mm -hmm. as I said, that tax burden, that rental burden has already, I, I can name people who right. have who paid for Project Connect for five years and are now displaced outside of Austin, they will never see the benefits, right? right? Unless they're able to return, that would be great. Right. <laughs> but the anti-displacement funding that was a big selling point of that ballot item, $300 million over 20 years, you know, 
So we should, in theory, if you do the math, we should have about $80 million in anti-displacements right now. Right. We've seen 14 million right. contracted yeah, out. Yeah. And most of that has not even hit implementation phase. Mm -hmm. So imagine how many of those people we could have kept right. in our neighborhoods and how many we could still keep in right. our neighborhoods of focus along those Project Connect lines that will not be mm -hmm. developed and how much we can invest in true transit services that are going to more equitably serve our population. I do think there's a path forward with Project Connect that's successful and right. brings us amenities that people are going to love and also doesn't just screw over the people who have been working the hardest, depending the most on transit and paying the most of their salary, frankly. Yeah. Lewis here just jumping in for a quick second. There were a lot of directions we could have gone to dig deeper into Project Connect with Carmen, but we wanted to cover more topics in our discussion as well. We did ask Carmen after the interview if she would elaborate a bit more on some of her positions here. She agreed and provided a statement that is included in full in the description of this episode wherever you are watching or listening. I encourage you to check it out. Also, if you've not liked this video, subscribed, or followed on your favorite podcast platform, please do so, like right now. Back to the conversation. I. Uh... I'm curious, uh, I kind of want to drill down on some of the, you mentioned like housing and obviously housing and transit go together hand yes. in hand with so much of this. And I'm, I'm curious, like I might disagree with you a little bit on some of this and I'm curious, I like want to actually hear uh, from you what, what your stance is. And I've been convinced to change my mind on something in a previous episode <laughs> with an interview we did. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll do it here again. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so um, obviously, and I'll kind of like set it up a little bit here, the like housing and transit go together. Yes. Um, if, you know, the city is growing quickly, obviously has been for a long time now, um, that leads to kind of densification of areas. People get displaced in the process of that, unfortunately, at which, and there needs to be a whole bunch more done to make sure that they are not. So I totally support all of the work that you've done to try to make sure that that happens. However, when there are these sorts of, uh, you know, the, the city is going to grow whether the kind of new development happens or not. It's a matter of does it grow inside of the urban core and kind of close in neighborhoods, or do we end up with folks kind of moving in on the outskirts, kind of leading to a or continuous sprawl, sprawl yeah. where Austin in the future can look something more like a Houston where there's ring highway after ring highway. Um, nobody, and, wants know, <laughs> nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. They don't want to be Houston. And, and it, it leads well, to... Well, some to, people want that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it leads to a couple of things that concern me as far as like longer commute times for folks. It leads to, which means more fossil fuels being burnt because the further out you get, the more difficult it becomes to serve people with transit, the more expensive it becomes to serve people with transit, the frequencies of bus, you know, uh, there's a whole uh, a list of things that happen there. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, the the and you might disagree with me on some. This is fine. No, uh, the, so far, the city, I, yeah. Keep, okay, keep, yeah. <laughs> keep, the only thing I actually agree with everything you said. The only thing I would change is you said or, and mm -hmm. I would say and. Okay. The urban core densifies and people sprawl yeah. out. Yeah, 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 for sure. No, and that's happening yeah. now. Yeah. So keep yeah. going. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the city council uh, fairly recently passed the home initiative. Uh, you've spoken out against the home initiative. Um, and I'm curious how your kind of position being against the home initiative uh, kind of can align with the, the desire to kind of increase transit service inside of the urban core um, because, you know, densifying inner areas is going to be easier to move people around, easier to be able to connect them to opportunities, whereas people who are being displaced right now before the home initiative even and have been for a while are the ones who have been kind of ending up further and further away Correct. than being stuck relying on worse and worse transit opportunities yes. as they're further away. Poor infrastructure and then the gentrification wave that ultimately yeah. comes outward, ripples outward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, no, I, I don't disagree with uh, with most of what you said. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of next negative externalities associated with um, development sprawling outward and um, I will say many of us can agree that we don't like these this trend of big suburban big box poor quality outdated subdivisions that just keep spreading further and further out. A uh, really important thing to remember is that the housing supply of Austin does not stop at the city limits. Right, right. The housing supply of Austin is a five county area. Oh, just yeah. ask any realtor that's showing you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have affordable housing in Hutto. <laughs> right. Um, you know, which Good was luck getting to work. A, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, a small town, you know, north yeah. of us, yeah. which is now part of our metro area. Right. So that's happened in all directions. And so it's really important to remember that the supply is a five county area and that many of those counties are 
welcoming that development because it's increasing their tax base and also because whether people like it or not, single family housing is very family friendly. Right. Um, it allows for neighborhoods as sort of the backbone of an area and it allows for neighborhood schools and it also can be developed in a way that is actually mixed housing types. I mean, most of our central city neighborhood subdivisions are not exclusively single family right. housing. They typically have a mix of, of different kinds of housing around them, right? right. And so that continues to be desirable uh, and affordable, a more affordable type of housing than the urban density that is prevalent in the market. And so that's a market force. Um, the demand for housing, however, this is where, this is where we disagree, um, not you and I, but <laughs> myself and supply side housing um, proponents, mm -hmm. which is that the, the demand for housing in Austin is actually, there are two separate markets that are crammed into the same supply. Mm -hmm. So there is a market for shelter, which the three of us at this table all need. Mm -hmm. So we all need a place to live. Right. And our demand for housing is based on a need for shelter. Mm -hmm. Then there is a, an investment market. Mm -hmm. That demand is demand for real estate to, re to get a return on investment, to buy cheap and sell high. Mm -hmm. That is and always will be the motivation of private equity <laughs> and private equity investment. Mm -hmm. And that is impacting the housing market in the same supply that you and I are looking for shelter in. Right. And so with those competing forces, this is why this is not a supply and demand 101. You build more housing and it's mm -hmm. less expensive. And that's proven out again and again mm -hmm. by data and anecdotally when you look at who is getting displaced where, who can afford to buy what, so housing right. for whom. Right. And we also need to look at density of people, not just density of units. Right. That's a place where we're really getting, we're missing the mark, I think, because I'm watching family-friendly units, um, uh, you know, community-friendly units, roommate-friendly units right. demolished in the name of density and getting far and away replaced with expensive single units, efficiencies in one bedrooms, especially those that are income restricted in these larger, denser developments, which we didn't even get with right. home, right? And so I am tired of watching our service industry, uh, predominantly people of color, mm -hmm. elders, people with disabilities, veterans, and longtime Austinites and previously displaced Austinites, right. as well as lower income newcomers. Mm -hmm. All those people I'm watching get displaced from Austin's urban core and even displaced from Austin's outer core mm -hmm. in the name of density. Now I have to tell you, I am pro quality density. Gotcha. I'm a Quimby. I like quality <laughs> in my good. backyard, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I personally Quimby, knock doors right. yeah. to lift a restrictive covenant to guarantee title insurance mm -hmm. for the Abali, a beautiful mixed low-income apartment complex, mm -hmm. high density, literally in the backyards of my neighbors. I can right. see it across the street. Um, my dad's neighborhood has negotiated thousands of new units. Right. One of the most successful models, which I, if as mayor, will make the model, the standard, mm -hmm. which is planned unit developments that encourage collaboration between philanthropy, private equity, mm -hmm. tax credits, and others gotcha. so that we can guarantee like the Think East PUD, you can go look at their rents today. <laughs> yeah. You can find a two bedroom for under 1300. Right. You know, you can find rentable, family friendly, um, single person housing for under a thousand a month, you know, permanently yeah. um, or at least for, you know, 40, I think the, the, the neighborhood negotiated even more. Mm -hmm. And that was not even a nonprofit development. Right. Those developers, one of them retired after that project. They made money. Yeah. It absolutely can be done. It, you know, I do want to negotiate good development. And, and you can look at my record on the Planning Commission. Yes, I was very vocal about projects that displaced working people from mm -hmm. Austin. Yeah. But I also voted in favor of tons of development right. projects. Um, I, I voted in favor of an expansion of the University Neighborhood Overlay, which is in its original form was considered one of the most successful densification, you know, increasing the population that could live in West Campus. Mm -hmm. What's it done for affordability? Look at the demographics of, right. you know, who can and can't live there. Mm -hmm. We have work to do, yeah. but we have tools that we're not using right. because there's tremendous imp of pressure to make this as profit driven as possible. Mm -hmm. And I just want the housing advocates to join me a little bit in fighting for themselves. I like what, you, what you're talking about. Like people are, regardless of, of how we densify in Austin, it's a five county metro area that we are 
um, going to see increased um, demand for housing outside of the city limits of Austin. I do think it is Austin, the, specifically the city, the residents, and the city council's responsibility to lead transit conversations for the metro region because if you, even if you're living in Hutto, you're living in Hayes County, you most likely work in Austin or you need to commute into Austin regularly. Um, the city council should be leading uh, the discussions with the metro region, um, connecting these, these outlying communities. Um, as mayor, do you have uh, a vision for what sort of an interconnected region could look like um, and, and what you would sort of advocate for? Oh, yes. Uh, the vision is uh, probably a, has a lot of steps, much like the missing middle you might talk about, of uh, what are the practical steps to get us tactically from these like intergovernmental campo, you know, uh, the, the actual, um, the Capital Metro and its, um, its current efforts to service even areas just outside of, of Austin, it is going to require serious collaboration, adaptation, curiosity, and innovation with these regional governments. You know, the, the current um, uh, mayor of Maynard is incredibly um, innovative and welcoming really cool types of growth and capital stacks and investment. Um, and that's like a tremendous uh, population that's been pushed out of Austin and is also yeah. rapidly growing to commute into Austin. Yeah. Um, I think we could get some conversations going and be more creative about those. What are those connecting pieces of transit that can take pressure off the need for the expensive light rail, right? How can we get our rubber wheels moving in ways that actually help our steel rail um, work more efficiently? And that's gonna be a lot easier said than done. Right. Um, but I'd also love to talk to them a little bit more, like could we get, um, given, given how different kinds of development can be cheap in Austin for developers and others more expensive, neighboring counties love you know, the, it's quick and easy and kind of known how to do these big subdivisions, but I would love to see that density, that various uh, housing types, um, more node and margin type, like it, we saw originally in Imagine Austin, the sort of town centers. Now, I don't necessarily think we should go 90 and 125 feet in low-income neighborhoods without serious talk about anti-displacement community benefit, but I do think uh, we need to be looking at those nodes and margins, that regional kind of development and transit that takes pressure off of those, off of 290, I-35, 183, you know, how can we develop a little smarter together? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I like that, that answer. I think there's a lot of projects um, sort of on the horizon or that are visionary projects that, um, that folks are talking about. One is the Lone Star Rail District, which we're hoping to, to do an episode on very soon. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with that, that initiative, um, but it's you know, connecting commuter rail from San Antonio all the way to Georgetown. Um, you know, stops in yeah, New Braunfels and San Marcos and uh, yeah. Kyle and other spots along. Sort of connecting this entire I-35 corridor, which could go a long way to helping alleviate some of the congestion on I-35, especially when you look at the numbers. I mean, the, the amount of people who live between San Antonio and Austin and how quickly these two regions are becoming the next mega region in the country. Um, I think there's some, some projects out there that are really exciting. I think just even for the Lone Star Rail District, it's uh, a couple hundred thousand uh, university students between the right. two the, between the two cities that oh, yeah. would have the opportunity to be able to to commute back and forth, and it would open up a lot of opportunity. Um, you look at cities like New Braunfels. Uh, New Braunfels is starting their first ever transit system, um, which is super exciting. So, um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. There, there's a, a, a regional need, and we have to sort of um, lead that charge to to connect these regions. We also need to do it in a way. Like what you were saying, light rail may not be the answer for every community. We do need to do it in a way that's really equitable. Um, what we've typically done in this region is uh, we go to the smaller communities and we build a toll road uh, from the smaller community back into town. It is, it, it is sort of a, a tax on underserved communities when they have to commute back into the metro region and the only viable route is a toll road. Um, so I like what you're saying. There's, yeah. there's more that we can do with um, interconnected travel around, around the region. It's like a comeback, just if I may. Like, it's ra like we used to have commuter trains yeah. that took us far. Yeah. 
-hmm. you know, that you would go on a weekend trip. Yeah. You know, my dad's generation growing up in the 50s and 60s, this was a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know the highway killed a lot of our, right. our railway dreams, yeah. but it's coming back. So yeah. we just need to make sure it comes back for everybody. We can't be charging people $1.25 or, or $2, $2.50 for the bus and $7 for the rail. Right. You know, we've got to come up Absolutely. with a more holistic, integrated system of funding mm -hmm. that allows everybody to take it because then they'll love it. Absolutely. Yep. We su if we could subsidize public transit the way that we subsidize road usage, <laughs> then maybe we can get there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, unfortunately, in Texas, with TxDOT deciding things, I don't know that we're going to get there anytime soon, but uh, I would hope so. Yeah. Um, uh, we should, uh, I don't want to be respectful of your time. Um, uh, I guess, is there any final parting thoughts uh, on anything, anything we didn't that we didn't hit as it pertains to transit that you want to hit? Um, yeah. Well, as you all really hit on, transit is connected to these other pieces mm -hmm. like housing and also infrastructure, which we didn't talk a lot about mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say to leave on a moment of hope, we are facing a once in a lifetime, once in, at least once in a career mm -hmm. opportunity of federal infusion of funds yeah. through the Inflation Reduction Act, through the bipartisan uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. bill. And this is going to be like one of those moments where rain is going to pour in terms of funding. And if we don't have buckets put out, we're going to miss the boat. Yep. So we need everybody. And I'm calling all the people who have ever complained about transit in Austin mm -hmm. to take the bus with me yeah. once a week this week. Mm -hmm. Take the bus. Get on the rail. Mm -hmm. Make some more plans because right. we cannot complain without having solutions. And we're gonna have to put aside some of our differences mm -hmm. and get back into our curiosity um, so that we can work together. Let's figure out a way to put some beautiful deals out there that leverage city, county, private, public with this massive infusion of federal funds mm -hmm. because we're gonna need it to climate proof our infrastructure and build something that's more sustainable so we can grow healthy and inclusive uh, in this beautiful city that I don't think is gonna become less desirable as long as we can make it open and, and you know, learn from the past. Absolutely. And uh, I guess, where can people find out more about your campaign? Yeah, they can come to carmen mayorcom It's Carmen, the number four mayor. Uh, you could... You know, I got my domain a little late, but you can say <laughs> it's a it's a it's a tribute to Prince. Nice. We'll, 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 say. Ma ah, nice. <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure the links are in the description wherever you might be listening or watching. Yes, um, and you'll be yeah. able to find also on Instagram Carmen for Mayor. Um, same, I'm on Facebook Carmen Yanis Polito for Mayor, um, and on Twitter, and probably soon on TikTok. Now that I've got Gen Z ah, nice. uh, leads yeah. on my team. Yes, yes, yes. Well, we'll have to follow you from our TikTok account as well. Excellent, uh, Carmen. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank really you both. It. It's yeah. been a delight. Yeah. So huge thank you to Carmen for joining us today uh, and giving us sort of her perspective on transit in Austin mm -hmm. and uh, telling us all about her mayoral race. If you have any uh, comments or questions, um, post those on the, the YouTube and we'll also share them with Carmen. Yes, post them on the YouTube. On the on, YouTube. On the YouTube. Uh, yeah, and if you're not subscribed already, please consider hitting the subscribe button, like this video to help get it out to more folks. Uh, and thanks for watching. Yeah, I'm saving that dough. Public transit's where it's at. Watch me go.